Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer. I'm with All Things Open. Thank you very much for joining us today. The title of our talk is Open UK, the UK's Open Technology Gateway, and our speaker today is Amanda Brock with Open UK. You can post questions or comments to Amanda in one of three ways. Use the chat stream, the Q&A, or raise your hand. And I will turn it over to Amanda now. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, from a, a very sunny London. Uh, I have a long story which will come to pass, or you will be made aware of as we work through this presentation this afternoon, but I'm actually in central London for one of the first times this year, and in the background behind me, you'll see the gherkin and the cheese grater, and over this way is the shard, uh, a very quiet central London. Um, but greetings, greetings to everybody in Raleigh and wherever you are around the world. And thank you very much to Todd and the team at All Things Open for having me along today to join the international track and to talk to you about Open UK. Um, we've got a lot of very exciting stuff going on, but uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes first just introducing you to me. Uh, I know it's a relatively small group, but I assume that these will be shared and uh, the video probably watched later. So let me give you a little bit of uh, background on me. Like many folk in open source, I don't have one job. So as well as being CEO of Open UK, I do a number of other things. I am a European representative of Open Invention Network, the world's biggest defensive patent pool, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. OIN is now 13 years old. It has a community of over 3,200 licensees, uh, over 2.5 million patents in the pool, and over 100 million of defensive patents that it's bought itself, which are licensed out to anybody who participates. And participating in OIN is actually one of the, the key aspects of good housekeeping that any organization coming to open source will take part in. There's all the governance work that uh, an OSPO or team working on the open source um, processes will undertake in uh, making sure that your open source is compliant. And an aspect of that should include joining OIN, which is zero cost and which means that you will give a license and also receive that from the other 3000 plus licensees in your group. And the license is to your patents to the extent that they read on or apply to software that's listed in a Linux system definition. Bit of a misnomer, it's actually an open source definition. Now I'm telling you a little bit about OIN because it's a true passion. Um, I was on OIN's board a number of years ago representing my employer Canonical and I've continued to work with OIN for about eight years now because it matters to me. And a lot of what I do is evangelism for them. So a little bit like what I'm doing today. So uh, OIN is one of my roles. I'm on a number of other advisory boards around open source, the OASIS, uh, Open um, Standards Organization. I'm on their open source projects advisory group. And I chair a group for the United Nations. The United Nations Technology and Innovation Labs, I chair their open source and IP advisory group with a number of notable open source folk. And that's done some great work, including helping advise on a blockchain being set up as a land registry in Afghanistan. The really rewarding work there. Um, something that I that the whole open for good piece is really close to my heart and something that I believe very strongly in. And I also work for a couple of organizations on a commercial basis. Uh, the talent acquisition and management platform Beamery is one of the organizations that I'm an, an advisor to. For my sins, I'm in the process, uh, I'm smiling because it's a, a tough job, but I'm in the process of editing a book and the book is made up of 20 plus chapters. Those are by some of the luminaries across open source. Um, people including Mark Radcliffe in California, Karen Sandler in New York, and then a bunch of people across Europe, Pam Chestick. The people who are the experts, the leading experts on the particular area in law governance and policy. And the book is called Free and Open Source Software, Law, Policy and Practice. It's a second edition. Uh, my particular chapter, which I have written as well as editing the book, relates to open source and business models. 
um, very fashionable topic at the moment, but it's something that's been dear to my heart for a decade. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about Canonical in a moment, but my experience in Canonical put me on the coal face as far as business models were concerned during the transition that we saw from a more traditional model to a platform economy. And uh, for me, I had to completely rewrite my chapter because of course business models have moved on so, so much since the first edition was published seven years ago. And that book is something actually that I'm very, very proud of. We are going to publish it open access and the open access is possible thanks to the Beach Foundation. So the book will be published by Oxford University Press, um, but it's a law textbook and it's going to be a very hefty law textbook and obviously not cheap, but it will be completely free and available as a PDF and uh, an e-reader through the Veatch Foundation sponsorship. So it's all very exciting. Um, and then I guess one of my roles is this kind of thing. I spend a lot of my life talking to people all over the world in another lifetime that involved me having 20 conference trips planned this year, booked and paid for back in January. And the only one of those sadly that I've been able to meet to make is FOSDEM in Brussels back in, in January, February. Um, so these days I spend a lot of my life on Zoom calls like this talking to myself. And usually today you are not having a special guest appearance from Dundee, my marmalade kitten who likes to climb over the keyboard mid-flow uh, because of course I'm in a, an office in central London. Um, but I do a lot of this kind of talking and I absolutely love the All Things Open posters. This is me with last year's one, which has been my, uh, my uh, I suppose, headshot for the last year. You'd be surprised by how many people have been willing to let me have my whole All Things Open poster as my, my headshot for the last few months. So how did a nice girl like me end up in a space like open source? Back in the annals of history, at the beginning of 2008, I was employed by a company I'm sure you all know, Canonical, and I was employee 165, and I was employed to set up and run the legal team, which I did for five years. And I was there from the beginning of 2008 to the very end of 2012. So a lot of transition and a lot of development across both uh, Ubuntu and the, the face of business and open source. And as I say, that, that really shaped a lot of my thinking. When I joined Canonical, I joined as a, a, a commercial lawyer, a general counsel, somebody who had spent uh, at that stage, I think about 12 years uh, being an in-house counsel. And I had been a, a head of legal since 2004. So almost five years in. Um, in fact, it's my second general counsel role. And for me, I had no understanding really of what open source meant when I joined Canonical. Of course, you know, I could have defined it. I could have written you a clause for a contract, but I had no real idea. And not only did I have no real idea what it was all about, also, I didn't actually have any concept that it would be something that for me became an absolute passion and would have led me to spend a lot of the rest of my career working in open. Uh, I've had a few other jobs since I left Canonical on the, the legal side, um, working in fintech and working for a data center. And the fintech was particularly interesting because I was working in emerging markets across places like Algeria, Bangladesh, Ukraine, Pakistan, um, and was doing financial transactions across the mobile for a Russian mobile phone company. So really interesting stuff. But all the way through, I've kept my role going with OIN and I've continued to work in a variety of open source projects. And that's because open source really, really became a personal passion for me. So when I moved back from Amsterdam, where I was working for the Russian mobile phone company um, about three years ago, couple of people who had set up the Open UK organization approached me and they approached me to get on board and to join the organization and I will be absolutely honest my initial reaction was that it wasn't interesting and it wasn't interesting to me because at that stage I just didn't understand the real value that these local organizations could have. I had worked on a personal level internationally since 2000 
and with uh, open source and all the, the stuff that I worked on there. It was attending global conferences. It was partnering and being part of projects all over the world. So the, the UK didn't massively interest me. And it was only really when I sat down and I watched um, what was going on in Europe, not just Brexit, but a little bit more broadly, that I realised the value that these organisations can and will have, not just uh, through Brexit, but on an ongoing basis. And that is something I hope will evolve as we go through this talk. So um, Open UK became more attractive to me and it, it became more attractive because I realized that the commission has been very engaged for the last couple of years across Europe. During lockdown, we've actually seen the European Parliament set up uh, a new rule, a new regulation requiring all European institutions to use open source. Now we've had that kind of policy in the UK for a decade or more. The problem is it's something that's not actually followed, it's something that's paid lip service to. So what we see is that the Europeans have gone that step further and they've said that there must be an audit associated with that software usage. So every institution will be annually audited to make sure that they have in fact um, complied with that open first ruling, something we don't have in the UK. And it's a brilliant example of what I thought might happen as I saw the commission's engagement and I saw the relative lack of engagement in the UK. And the focus of course, being on um, getting through the Brexit process. Now that was long before any of us knew the pandemic was around the corner or that we were gonna be dealing with lockdowns. But we obviously had major concerns about where the UK was going and whether or not we could I can make that into something positive and a real opportunity for the UK, which I hope we will. And for me, that opportunity largely comes out of the people. And we have the most amazing people in the UK with incredible experience in open technology. I was very cross back at Vosdem. I went to an Open Forum Europe presentation where someone got up and said the UK lacks skills in open. And it's absolute balderdash to use a, a very British term. Um, the UK is overrun with open technology talent. The problem is we don't know it and we haven't brought them together. And when we sat down and started to assess who was here, you would be so surprised at the quality of the people. So for me, I decided that it was worth taking a punt with Open UK. And although I pretty much work full time, a lot of the time on Open UK, I've taken on a part time role as CEO. I'm on the board and I'm on a number of our, our work groups and committees. Um, I pulled together the most amazing board and with the kind of talent that I'm talking about in the UK, I'm sure that's no great surprise to you. We have people like Neil McGovern and Rob McQueen from Gnome, Don Foster from VMware, Matt Jarvis, uh, Terence Eden, who was running NHSX as open uh, source, uh, including the track and or test and trace app as it's now called, whilst he was on secondment at uh, the NHSX project. You know, incredible, incredible people. We don't just have those software people, we have people from hardware like John LeBan and Andrew Katz, who was the author of the CERN open hardware license and open data folk like Jenny Tennyson from the ODI. So I pulled together this amazing board and we met actually in this building in London back in January. And we sat down and we spent a day where I had not expected us to be able to come to consensus or agreement and was absolutely amazed that we were able to get this vision together in that day. And our vision as an organization is to develop and sustain UK leadership in open technology. And we came up with a definition that we think is universal of open technology, which is open source software, open hardware and open data. And with those three opens, we end up, we believe, covering anything of relevance around the open space. I believe we're the first organization anywhere in the world actively uniting those three and being honest about it. There are some who are dabbling and who've brought hardware projects or data projects into their remit, but none who are actually saying that their remit is the, the three opens and open technology. And um, one of the things that we've done a lot of as Open UK is to create visuals. We found that visuals really help to engage with the community. 
So how are we going to build this uh, UK leadership? Well, I've mentioned that we already have a lot of talent. And what we have to do with that talent is to build a visible and loud community around open technology. And we do that by uniting people across various projects, by influencing legal and policy to make sure that the UK is a fabulous place to do open business, and by building education and learning and open technology. And I'm gonna take maybe 10, 15 minutes to run through some of those. So we build a visible and loud community around the, um, around open technology in the UK by united people across communities. And we are not specific to any one project. We don't hold code. We are here as an industry organization and an advocacy group to make open work better. Um, we run our own projects, a lot of which are around legal and policy. Um, legal, as you would expect, would include uh, commenting and legislation, but policy is really, really broad. And we also communicate with our broad audience through a variety of events and activities. We've got a, a large number of blogs and we're now moving to launch a podcast early next year. Uh, we have mailing lists where anybody is welcome to join and our events sadly haven't been quite as many as we would have hoped and you may notice at the very end there awards 20th of October I am completely insane and you'll now understand my sparkles and my hairdo but our Open UK awards are taking place in a couple of hours time and again I'll come back to those in a little bit more detail in a moment so the awards I'll come back to them right now uh, Open UK is hosting its first awards this evening hence my being in central London we wanted to have some lovely engagement with our community where there's a couple of us hosting and we'll be in different cities with different landmarks behind us. And the awards are all about celebrating UK leadership in open technology. We had 84 entries, which I was blown away by in our first year. And those entries are across six categories and the six categories are open source software, open hardware, open data, individual, young person and that's one of the categories that was just most amazing and um a, a finos sponsored fintech and finance and open source award and uh we whittled down a short list of three our judges include jenny tennyson from the odi henry nash of ibm and katie gamanji who is at amex now, they have had a really tough time creating that shortlist and deciding who the winners will be, and the winners will be announced this evening. Um, that event will actually also include our kids' competition winners, and I'll talk to you a bit more about those in a moment. So that, the way we are bringing people together, I'm going to go back to that slide, the way we're bringing together will be through things like events, through things like our awards, through recognition of individuals, building the collective, social media. We've gone from having about 600 people in our, our social media and our Twitter following to almost 1,500. I think we're about 30 short of 1,500 today. Uh, when we tweet some of our tweets, the impressions will be between 50 and 100,000. That is incredible for an organization that nine months ago, nobody had heard of. And our trajectory has been through the roof. Um, within weeks of launching the organization, we were being asked if it would be possible for us to uh, create a model that we could roll out in other countries. And that is something that we're seriously looking at and I'll talk to you about towards the end. So as well as our community work, as I said, we're influencing legal and policy to make sure the, the UK is a great place to do open. And that's involved us commenting on UK and European legislation. I think probably because we had such highly skilled individuals in the UK in this area, it was very, very easy for us to build a very strong group in no time at all. And for that group to be recognized, not just in the UK, but internationally. Um, and we were asked by February to go and meet with UK government's trade negotiators working on the Brexit trade uh, agreements and to help them with provisions that relate to source code. So we had some good discussions with them, um, trying to ensure that any source code provisions in the treaties will be compliant with open source requirements. And we've also worked on a joint report with the Commission's Open Source Observatory 
And it was really flattering that we had been identified by them in such a short time as the actor in the UK, the strategic partner that you would go to in the UK. Um, there is both a, a long document and a, a one page PDF on the also website that I would commend to you, which has a full overview of the status of open source in the UK. And then our third, our third piece of work has been to build education and learning in open technology. We've had a kids competition. Now, the kids competition was something that we had in place right at the beginning of the year. And I have to say, after all the work we've done, that course changing broke my heart. We had arranged for the winners from each of the five UK regions to come to London. Red Hat was sponsoring, GitHub have also given us some support and covered our admin costs. And we were bringing the kids to London to do a day's work in the Red Hat Innovation Labs, where they would also be meeting the singer, the double Grammy award winning singer Imogen Heap and spending the day with her. And unfortunately, by March, April, we were already realizing that 20, uh, 20 was not a year to move kids around the UK. It certainly wasn't a year to ask children to share a glove. And at the heart of our competition is something called the Mini Moo Glove, um, which is a kid's version of Imogen Heap's software glove, uh, musical software glove. Absolutely gutting having that in place and losing it. But I think this shows our resilience and our determination and I'm quite proud of this. We repurposed the monies that we had for that travel and that day or two nights in London. And we spent it instead on building a kids course. I think our kids course, which is available at www.openuk.uk backslash open kids camp is probably the first set of educational materials of its kind for children. It's uh, an animated course using the Mini Moo Glove. The Mini Moo Glove is available from Pi Moroni. It's 40 pounds with a micro bit, 30 without. So it's not an expensive piece of kit. Um, the course is 10 animated lessons, around 10 minutes long each, and each of which spends a minute explaining open source. And it goes through what source code is, what open source means, copyright, licensing, creating a community, modifications and improving other people's code and then resharing code. Um, it's an absolutely brilliant course. And the singer Imogen Heap narrated the first episode for us. They're all available on YouTube. We packaged them up with 10 e-zines and made them available as an open kids camp. Thanks to Huawei, we had sponsorship to give away 3000 mini moo glove kits to kids across the UK and to create a summer camp from those e-zines and uh, uh, the course episodes. It is really fabulous and I would commend it to all of you. We did it because we wanted to create a splash and we wanted to create it as a stepping stone or a segue to building a GCSE, which is an exam that 16 year olds would do in the UK. So everybody does a set of those before they leave school and also an apprenticeship scheme. And we have an active group now worker, two groups working on each of those with a view to having them in place by 2022. So our goal is that there will be an apprenticeship scheme working with a number of companies, hopefully including our sponsors and donors, and also a qualification, an academic qualification, which will be available as an option to high school students and also available in colleges. So watch this space. We hope to be launching that by the end of 2021 and for children and young people to be entering our apprenticeship scheme in 2022. Um, we also set up a university group which is something that I think is fair to say has totally suffered from the, the consequences of the pandemic. The group fell away as we went into lockdown. We had intended to resurrect it in um, September. I don't know about the rest of the world, but here in the UK, people going to university for the first time, universities trying to manage the pandemic situation, it's been very, very difficult. So we've decided to leave that on hold until January. At some point next year, assuming we're all able to travel again, we will do a posse, Professors Open Source Software Education, thanks to the sponsorship of Red Hat and Google. And this is a little bit of the 
uh, marketing collateral from the kids competition and that's our course uh, for May and our competition in September so that's post pandemic and that's an image of the, the mini move love. Actually, as part of our process, MyMoo, the company who owns the MiniMoo glove, open sourced the hardware and the gloves. So it is possible if you get hold of a micro bit to build your own glove with a speaker, a couple of other things. And this is one of the stills which will give you a sense of the, the graphics in our animating and animation even. And it gives you just a, a feel for what we were doing. And that's with Imogen Heap in the first episode. They really are fabulous. And I can't say that I'm gonna get much more excited in life than to hear Imogen Heap explaining open source. The feedback we've had from the course and from the competition has often revolved around girls and with a, a role model like Imogen and somebody so creative what we found is that we've been told that a number of girls who thought, quote, coding would be boring, have been really excited to be making music through lockdown and actually are keen to do more coding. We are very honored to be one of 20 phase one winners in the GNOME Community Engagement Challenge. Now, with 20 winners, it sounds like quite a lot, but actually I think there were 148 entrants. So it's a very big deal for us. And we are working now on uh, our submission to the second round. So keep your fingers crossed for us. We'd be very excited to get through. We've already won $1,000 and the next stage, the prize monies would help us with next year. I believe that we will be doing a further kids competition and also a further course with Red Hat, which means that we will hopefully be running our summer camp again with the, the course we've already done, but fingers crossed we'll have a second one too. And then one project that's a little bit left field is Ditto, Develop in the Open. And that's a project that's Innovate UK funded um, around open healthcare. It's creating an, EO, an open source EOB system with Innovate funding. And we've been involved on more of the sort of governance and support side. And in doing that, we have been um, working with the Open Chain project to make sure that our outputs are Open Chain compliant. And Ditto is going to be the first project as opposed to organizational company that is open chain compliant. We'll be sharing a case study on that quite soon. So how's Open UK being run? Well, I've mentioned that I'm working mostly, almost pretty much full time, although I am paid part time and I'm spending a lot of my time speaking. I didn't write this, but apparently I'm also inspiring. I hope I am and leading, which I am definitely doing. There is a lot of leading being done right now. I am supported by an admin a couple of days a week and both the admin and I receive some level of remuneration. The rest of the leadership team are volunteers. Andrew Katz has been our GC since January and been invaluable. We have the most amazing VP of comms, a chap called Mark Kember from One Byte, who has been volunteering since February when he found us. And I have to say, Mark has been a wonderful support and entree across uh, a huge amount of um, I guess different different places in the tech sector. He brings us lots of opportunity. And I'm hoping that the new board, which covers business development, um, community, legal and policy and learning, support functions like the CFO role, and also a new role that we've developed called a partnership one. I'm hoping they'll bring a lot to it. That partnership role is actually just worth explaining to you. We have joined as many open source organizations across the, across the globe as we can. And we want to really engage and participate. We're not a, a narrow inward looking open source organization that's country specific. We're country specific because we want to know our neighbors and work with them, but we want to participate in big international projects. So we've joined Eclipse and the Linux Foundation. We've joined Open Compute, the Open Hardware Group various organizations and our partnership director, Jamie, is coming on board so that he can help us to identify where there's opportunity for folk in the UK to work with and represent us on those organizations. And those should be some really fantastic opportunities for people that they may not otherwise have had, but it will also, I hope, make sure that we have good representation around the world and are really an active part of the open source community. 
Um, we also have many volunteers who work on different work streams or who are part of our different activities. And I've shared with you, I mean, nothing for us is particularly confidential. I've shared with you some of the exciting new people that we've brought on board. One of the things I love about the leadership team is that we've intentionally brought people on who you won't know. They're not the usual figures from open source in the UK or open hardware, open data. To some extent, our board is, and I am. You know, we're the people that you see speaking at conferences all the time. But these sort of eight new people are all people who have a passion for open, who really want to learn and be involved and engage. So I would ask that if any of you meet any of my team, my wonderful leadership team at a conference that you take some time to talk to them and help them to integrate and to meet new folks around open because they really are the future and that that's what we're all about developing that uk leadership not in a xenophobic way not in an insular way but developing the talent that we have to participate in a global stage and um you can see we've broken those down into the different groups as well so how are we being funded well when it was first instigated, Open UK was a membership organisation, and that's not for me. I feel very, very strongly that I want to lead an organisation that follows a model where anyone can participate. And that's what we're all about. Anybody who wants to come along to one of our events, anybody who wants to join any of our projects can, so long as they follow our code of conduct and our competition policy. However, in terms of funding the organisation, as of today, we also have a supporter model where individuals can pay a small monthly subscription and receive a number of benefits by doing so. For me, the key benefit there is that they will be able, once they've spent six months as a subscriber, uh, as a supporter, they will be able to vote in our board elections and to stand to be part of that board should they wish. Now, those elections will take place annually for half of the board. It will follow the Scottish STV system. And uh, we've had a, a lot of input from the board to get that right. The first election should take place, I believe, in September next year, and that will be for half the board. And thereafter, we will see half the board resign and uh, move annually. And we restrict the number of terms they have. So obviously that's very important to us, but building that subscriber base is also very important because the, the supporter base will be what pays for the basic organizational costs. Paying for our overhead, for myself, for admin, for more employees and um, contractors over time, people building competitions and people building uh, skilled activities like the course need to be paid. They can't be on a volunteer basis. And uh, that's where we then look for sponsors and donors. We have a number of donors, including Microsoft, Google, Arm and Facebook, who very generously have funded us to allow the organization to exist and generally achieve our goals. And then we have specific sponsors who sponsor events like Red Hat and GitHub, who sponsored our kids competition, Huawei, who sponsored the giveaway and the kids camp, and Bristos, who are sponsoring the Open Source Awards taking place this evening. We have in-kind sponsorship from a number of organizations providing us with staff and resourcing and uh, specialist advice. And also uh, organizations like Field Fisher, the law firm whose offices I'm in today, who will provide office space. And there's a bit more detail here about the individual supporters, but I'm slightly conscious of time. Um, I just want to reiterate that in terms of participants, anyone can participate and our participants are made up of our supporters, individuals who just want to be part of a project or organisations who want to be part of a project, donors, sponsors, friends, members, we have a big and welcoming organisation. Our finance for 2021, as I've mentioned, will expand into that supporter area. And in 2021, we are already planning a number of activities. We intend to hold a second awards. Let's hope, fingers crossed, that tonight works out okay. And we will have a second edition of the skills competition sponsored by Red Hat. Um, we look to build our supporters by a number of interactive events. If we're able, we will be creating pods for people to get together in across the UK so that they can enjoy FOSTEM in small groups. But of course, like everybody else, we're in an environment where we don't know what's going to happen. We were obviously at a medium level of alert in London. We've moved to high. We're still able to do a certain amount of meeting outdoors, but we wouldn't be able to meet indoors in groups for that at the moment. 
So fingers crossed we get back to being on a medium alert across the UK and that we're able to participate in activities face to face. We're also gearing up to continue with our online activities. I would commend to you our future leader sessions at noon on Friday. They're also available on YouTube. We've got some of the great and the good of open source, giving a presentation of around 40, 45 minutes. It covers all aspects. This week we have Rancher talking about running an open source business. And it's a great opportunity in a very informal space to learn about open, to meet some new people and to, um, to learn about open. So with the Future Leaders Group, I should briefly mention them. It's a group of younger business um, people, generally not developers, but developers would be very welcome. And they're people who come into contact with or want to know more about open as part of their business. Perhaps they have an expertise in one of the three opens and not at all. And that group is also doing a review of government procurement terms and processes, and will be providing a report uh, a little later this year. Now, excitingly, I'm sharing with you, uh, I'm sharing this for the first time now, that we are working with people in Kenya to create a pilot in the spring, probably Q1, Q2 next year, where we will federate the Open UK model, the three opens, the three pillars, community, legal and policy and learning, and hope that that will allow us to create a sustainable model that's replicable in a useful way across other countries. Obviously, every country is going to have its own flavour to add, but we hope that we've done something that's uh, useful and replicable. So with that, I'm going to leave you. I hope that this has been a useful session. I'm very grateful to you for coming along today.